Good morning, everyone. Do you guys typically whistle or? Good morning, uh, everyone. If I can have your attention, we'd like to, to get uh, started this morning. Um, uh, we are lucky in the Division of Cardiology to have um, a couple of named uh, lectureships that are sponsored by uh, one former and one current uh, faculty. Uh, this morning's uh, lecture is part of um, a sponsorship by um, uh, Dr. Werner Sampson and his wife Joan, and they have been doing this for several years, and we're very thankful to them because in you know, in an age where um, it is increasingly difficult um, to bring in invited speakers, and particularly to get them to make a, a, the type of commitment that allows them to interact with fellows and faculty um, is difficult. And the uh, kindness of uh, Joan and Werner have allowed us to do uh, this. And so we very much appreciate it. So thank you very much. Very much. Werner was one of the original three, which was the sort of three original people of the Division of Cardiology um, with him, uh, uh, Len Cobb, and uh, Bob uh, Bruce. So he's been here through it all. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Kim uh, Eagle this morning. Um, it is amazing uh, uh, watching Kim walk through the medical center, the number of people that he knows, and I think that uh, is actually evident from his uh, CV as you browse through the 500 or so different publications. He said, you realize he has done one of the things you're not supposed to do in academic medicine, which is to have a broad range of interests and be a bit of a Renaissance man. Um, and so he has had a very large impact in the way we practice cardiovascular medicine uh, across the spectrum. Um, he has been involved in writing many of the guidelines we use to practice today, as well as being uh, one of the uh, people who have been responsible for generating the data that's used to uh, go into those um, uh, uh, guidelines. He has held a number of local and uh, uh, both national leadership uh, positions. He looks like he has gone through most of the administrative positions at the University of um, uh, Michigan, including the director of their cardiovascular center, um, and I believe uh, as uh, chief of the division. At one point, he uh, is endowed chair with the uh, Albion Walter Hewlett uh, chair and was recently also cross-appointed in the um, uh, uh, School of uh, um, uh, Public Management and, and Policy. Um, I'm, this morning, he is going to talk on one of, uh, um, one of the topics I've known or followed his work for on a long time, which is preoperative assessment of cardiac patient undergoing non-cardiac surgery, uh, state of the art. And so I'd like to welcome Kim and thank him again for coming out and visiting us. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here. I uh, want to thank the Sampson family for your generosity in creating the professorship, this visiting professorship. It's, um, I, I really love to come to a place that honors the history of excellence that, that you have. And this is one of those vehicles that does that. And, you know, we, we can't take for granted the people that went before because the, the kind of training and facilities and programs you have are built by people decades before your arrival. And so this kind of a venue is a wonderful chance to reflect on that and, and give thanks for it. Uh, I've been involved in this field for a long time. Um, and I, I think about the Ecclesiastes quote, if you think you know anything, you know nothing. And by the end of this hour, I think you will see rather clearly that Kim Eagle thought he knew something and now he's not sure he knows anything about this field. It's a conundrum. Um, these are my disclosures. I do not believe, uh, in, in, in truly good faith, I do not believe any of these will be conflicts with my remarks. However, if you know of anybody funding research in this area, will have them call me. Um, I would be very interested in talking to them. Um, 
So we're going to talk about how we estimate a patient's risk for uh, non-cardiac surgery, what are the causes of perioperative events, the role of non-invasive testing today, medical therapy. What about coronary revascularization? Should we ever do it for this purpose? Um, how should we screen patients today and manage them? And then some final thoughts and, and, uh, and funny jokes at the end. Always make things as simple as possible. And this was Einstein. And what I would like to submit to you is, I'm sorry, is there a pointer up here? Do I just, is there a pointer? I, I managed to forget to bring mine, so if somebody could find one. The first thing is I want to I wanna have you um, think about this whole hour as, uh, I want to teach you a way of thinking. If, if I do that, I'll be successful. And the way of thinking is Bayesian. Clinical markers of risk give you a sense of overall risk. Assessing the patient's functional capacity in their daily life. And then considering the surgery itself leads you to a branch point where you decide what it's reasonable to proceed or maybe the patient should be evaluated and or managed differently. Okay? It's very simple. Um, but it's not so simple, is it? Um, and if you ask the question, what are the clinical markers? I'm happy to tell you, you can count them on one hand. If you look at large studies of perioperative risk, known coronary artery disease, prior heart failure, diabetes, renal insufficiency, all have hazard ratios of two to three. These are the independent predictors of risk. Even I can remember these four. Thank you so much. So these are the four I want you to remember. Now, this is an important one to reflect on because a lot of patients don't know they have coronary heart disease, do they? So if you go to the Framingham study today, Framingham, Massachusetts, it's all the people go to get evaluated every year. They get an EKG, they get an echo. If you show up at Framingham this year with a new infarct, Q waves and a wall motion abnormality compared to last year. And if you're a female, what's the likelihood that you will not know you had the MI? Anybody want to guess? 40%. And if it's a man, it's 30%. Now, my opinion is they're probably not silent MIs. They're silent patients. I don't know if you've noticed, but many of our patients are lousy diagnosticians. They're terrible. You know, I pulled a muscle in my chest with my snowblower. It went in my arms and my jaw. I sweat for two days. <laughs> Talk about a pectoral strain. No, I'm sorry. That was an LID infarct. And uh, so the EKG doesn't lie. If you find an infarct on an EKG, it doesn't lie. It's every bit as predictive of risk as if they did remember they had it, and especially if it's recent. So that's an important caveat. And you can lump these markers together and see elevated risk. If you have three or four of them, vascular surgery, your risk of an MI or death is 8.5%. And so these markers are useful. The other thing that's very useful is functional capacity. If you ask the question, on a stress test, what predicts death? It would not be ischemia. It would not be chest pain. It would be how long did you walk, right? So I walked on a treadmill for an hour this morning, and I had absolutely no symptoms at all. I would waltz through a major operation. I've got great functional capacity. Contrary-wise, if you can't walk four blocks, look out. I don't know why. Is it your lungs? Is it your hip? Or might it be that your cardiac reserve is poor? If you ask studies of anaerobic threshold, you see that poor anaerobic threshold, massive mortality. But just a simple question, Mrs. Jones, could you walk four blocks or up two flights of stairs? If she says no, her risk is twice as high as if she said yes. And so what patients do in their daily life and whether they're symptomatic is very helpful. And you have to tease this out. Do you exercise? No, never. Oh, do you shop? Well, actually, yes, I do shop. Do you carry grocery bags? Oh, you do. How far do you go? Oh, 250 yards. Do you get out of breath doing that? When you wheel your dumpster out to the road, any, any of you have a dumpster? 
Mine's really heavy. I may be 60 pounds on a heavy week. You know, that's serious. So you have to get into their life to figure out what they do that's stressful. And then ask the question, okay, do you get tightness in your chest, your jaw, are you out of breath? Are you amazed that you have to stop three times? We have to get that information. And then we get to surgery-specific risk. And, and you're all familiar, aortic disease Cross-clamp the aorta. I mean, that's heavy stuff, right? But non-carotid peripheral vascular surgery is every bit as risky. Why? Bad disease. Peripheral arterial disease and other diseases like in the coronaries. Let's put major thoracic and abdominal in the intermediate range. And these are in the lower risk categories. And studies like this one done on the CAS registry, patients with known coronary disease medically treated before beta blockers, abdominal, thoracic, four, seven percent. So we're going to put these three in the higher risk. This is a small sample. We study this in Michigan, subsequently, head and neck cancers, 450 patients. It's not that high. It's a couple percent. It's in a lower risk group. And in the current era, here's the data suggesting that lower extremity bypass and aortic surgery essentially have the same risk. Bad patients having low extremity bypass, okay? The other thing to take home from this slide is if you're having an aortic aneurysm repair, don't be a person's first case because your risk is a lot higher than somebody who does a lot of these, okay? Volume matters with highly technical procedures. It matters with cabbage, it matters with angioplasty, and it matters with AAA repair. And I think it really matters with valve surgery, frankly. I want, the first question is, if I got into trouble here with a mitral valve problem, you send a surgeon to me, I'm gonna ask him, how many did you do last year? And he says, oh, I did three or four. I'm gonna say, who else do you have? Because I want a high volume operator working on me. These are lower risk operations. So these patients have known disease and their risks of MI or death is less than 2%. Orthopedic surgery probably carries a higher risk of PE than coronary events. And in the current era, we see a lot of endovascular AAA. They have a mortality under 2%. Carotid surgery, about a half a percent. And many of these, lumpectomy, thyroidectomy, et cetera, very, very low risk. If you find yourself doing cardiac screening for an operation that carries 0% risk, I'm sorry, that doesn't make any sense. And you'll see it occasionally, cataract surgery. I had a call last week from an eye doctor. Geez, you know, Mr. Jones is 80, he's got some angina, he's diabetic, he's had a heart attack. You think I should do a stress test? No, take his cataract out. He'll be fine. The stress of that is like walking in the park. Just do it. Nike. No, that's not Seattle. That's Portland, right? Okay. <laughs> Bariatric surgery is moderate risk surgery. These patients have a 2% a two 30-day mortality and a 4% one-year mortality, and they're hard to evaluate, aren't they? Uh, the imaging doesn't get to see their heart very well. They can't walk very far, and we're, it's, so it's tough. It's very tough. So how simple is this? Four clinical markers, hazard ratio, relative risk two to three, poor functional status, relative risk of two, higher risk surgery, relative risk of three. I love it, it's so simple. So who should you test? And the first question in this area particularly is if the test results will lead to a change. Have they been tested recently? What are you worried about? Coronary disease, valve disease, LV dysfunction, what is your concern? And always, if they can exercise, that's so helpful. Because if they go a long time, you know their risk is low. Their risk of a fatal event is very low. The conditions where you should stop the train and say, okay, time out, this patient should have a deferral on the elective operation and we should figure out what to do, unstable coronary syndromes, poorly compensated heart failure, symptomatic arrhythmias, and severe valve disease, and particularly stenotic. So in the valve disease categories, we want to deal with the valve before the elective non-cardiac surgery. 
Um, aortic stenosis is symptomatic. They have a death rate of about 10%. So that would be something you'd like to deal with before you fix their hip if you have a chance. Um, if they're asymptomatic, they do well. There are studies suggesting that even severe aortic stenosis in a good place like you have with good hemodynamic monitoring, they should do fine. The key is to avoid a low preload. You do not want them to get hypotensive, okay? You don't. Severe mitral valve stenosis also doesn't do well perioperatively, and you get called to the recovery room. Somebody goes into AFib and suddenly they're in pulmonary edema, and they have rheumatic mitral stenosis. So if you find symptomatic mitral stenosis before surgery, we'd like to pop that valve and then have the surgery later. The revergent lesions generally tolerate non-cardiac surgery better, except for cross-clamping the aorta in severe aortic valve regurgitation. That's a nasty problem. It's a very nasty problem. So you can find yourself with intraoperative pulmonary edema from that sudden massive increase in afterload. For heart failure, the key is to understand the etiology. Don't you love this? hef pef and hef ref This is hef pef is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and hef ref is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And Hockham, I love that. It sounds like you're going to cough. Hockham is obstructive cardiomyopathy. You, you need to know the etiology of heart failure to actually manage it perioperatively. So if you have a patient who comes to you with heart failure symptoms and you don't know their etiology, you sh should figure that out because their therapy requires your understanding the physiology. Okay? If they have severe HEFREF, reduced ejection fraction, it's the one time that Kimmy will say to an anesthesiologist, you know, this person has really borderline F left ventricular systolic function. And my limited knowledge of general anesthetics is that all negative inotropes. And so I'm a little worried about their cardiac reserve. You never tell an anesthesiologist which anesthesia to use. That is, you know, you're going to find yourself bleeding on the sidewalk. <laughs> but that would be a moment where you could say, you know, I'm worried about cardiac reserve and this person's EF is 25%. And if there's a chance of doing regional anesthesia versus general, you might choose to do that kind of thing. Hockham is important because if they obstruct and they get volume depleted, they do worse. The relative degree of obstruction is worse with a shrunken ventricle. So that patient in heart failure, if they're congested, if you diurese them, they may get worse because their relative obstruction gets worse. So this is why when you see heart failure symptoms, Understand the etiology, especially if they're going to have a major perturbation with non-cardiac surgery. So what about preoperative screening for coronary disease? I put this slide up just because I want you to see that none of the tests that we've used over time have sensitivities anywhere near 98% for finding patients that are going to have an MI. I mean, even the best, if you look at that, you say, well, we're going to miss one out of six, right? That's not that good. And here's preoperative nuclear imaging before vascular surgery. The positive predictive value is only 12%. That means if we find ischemia, only one out of eight is going to have an event. Okay, so you probably know where I'm going with this. And same with stress echo, only one out of five is going to have an event. So because the test characteristics ain't that great, that requires you to be good. You have to be a smart clinician. Otherwise, you're going to use the tests in the wrong patient, and you might find yourself confused. Okay, so am I worried? Can they exercise? I'll do a stress test. If I'm worried about valve disease, I'll put echo with it. If I'm trying to quantify muscle at risk, probably nuclear is a little better. It finds subendocardial ischemia better. If I'm worried about a false positive, echo probably less false positives. So if I'm just trying to be sure there's nothing really bad, I'll probably do stress echo. And both nuclear and echo can give us left ventricular function with current testing. And the role of CT and MR in this group is just not yet clear. Okay? All right. Who knows Reverend Mays? 
Steve, you got to raise your hand. Steve knows Reverend Bays. 1780s or so. The Reverend Bays, cool guy. He was a reverend by day, and he wrote math at night. I've never gotten into that. I don't write a lot of math at night. But he did. And he came up with this idea. The risk of something happening in a population of folks starts with the relative risk overall, then modified by a test result. So the brilliance of Bayes' theorem is this, this concept of the anchoring probability. That's the first place, and then you modify that with the test. Here's a beautiful example of Bayes' theorem in action in preoperative assessment. This is five academic centers in the Northeast looking at elective AAA repair in one year. They all got seen by a cardiologist who looked at them and decided were they low, moderate, or high clinical risk based on the markers we talked about. Remember those markers? Diabetes, CAD, heart failure, renal dysfunction. So we got a low risk group, moderate risk group, high risk group. Then they get a test looking for ischemia, and that test is further stratified into no ischemia. Yep, there's some ischemia or lots of it, okay? Then they had surgery. They went ahead and had their surgery. So here's this low risk group. There's, their event rate is 3%. If their stress test looks good, their event rate is, uh, huh, it's 3%. They have ischemia, it's, um, well, it's 3%. 30 of them had really ugly tests. Oh my gosh, their event rate was 0%. Now, if you say the test doesn't work, Reverend Bayes pops out of his grave, slaps you on the head and say, no, 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 no. I told you low risk is low risk. You didn't need the test. It wasn't helpful. Now, here's your Friday afternoon consult right over here. It's usually about 6 o'clock. It's your friendly vascular surgeon, you know, kind of just wanted you to know. Oh, okay, what's, uh, what's cooking? Well, you know, it's usually a patient by the name of Hope or Faith. <laughs> and, it, you know, the, the dialogue goes something like, you know, we're, we're, doing a, we're just doing a little femme pop on Faith tomorrow morning. Um, just wanted you to know about her. Uh, you know, she's had a few issues, actually. She's diabetic and she's had some heart failure and a couple of infants. Parks. When she uses her electronic toothbrush, she describes a chest tightness. <laughs> and then he says, but her stressed allium study looked good. <laughs> and you're thinking, oh my God. So, you know, here's Faith, 18% event rate. And if you do the test and it looks good, the event rate drops to 12%. That's still high. And if it's an ugly looking test, it only goes up to 24%. It moves a little bit, but we knew before the test that Faith was high risk. She's getting angina brushing her teeth, right? And she's had MI's diabetes heart failure. I don't need a test to tell me this. In fact, the test is truly worthless. And again, Reverend Bayes would say high risk is high risk. But for all the tests we use, sometimes there's a sweet spot where the prior probability and the test interact in such a way that you move risk in such a way that you, could, you might change your mind about something. And in this study, it was the moderate risk group. Patients, say, with angina and uh, Q waves. 8% overall risk of MI or death. If the test is negative, it's 3%. And if it's very ugly, it goes up six times to 19%. That is a pretty big range. And if you get to 20%, you might say, you know what? I, I might want to call a timeout here. The aneurysm is only 5.4. And this lady's 84. Maybe we should wait. You know, the, the wonderful one is when you're, you know, they have claudication. And you start talking about a heart catheterization. And suddenly they say, geez, my leg feels so much better <laughs> after our conversation. Because, geez. You know, I got a little pain in my leg, and suddenly you're talking about messing around with my heart. Maybe not, Doc. Maybe I could live with this hip a little longer. So Bayes' theorem, we keep discovering this. You know, the latest 
is troponins. Our fellows are chasing troponins all through the hallways of our hospital. There are troponins everywhere. It's unbelievable. It's really quite scary. I think they're taking over. You know, this, this kind of study led to the Society of Vascular Medicine last year to publish five things physicians and patients should question. And one of them is avoid testing in patients having lower surgery. It's a waste. And, and not infrequently, I think, we actually hurt patients by over-testing them. So what causes perioperative MIs anyway? It's probably catechol surges, prothrombotic environment, blood loss, volume shifts, coronary plaque destabilization, and fixed coronary disease. Notice that of these six, stress testing only finds this one, right? So stress testing finds fixed disease, but it can't tell you the patient's going to get a hemoglobin down to five because somebody nicked a mesenteric artery. So we have to be thoughtful about, oh, yeah, geez. We can find some things, but th some things we can't predict. The catechol surges are dramatic. Here's uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine right after induction in aortic surgery. The norepinephrine level stays up for about seven days. And the patients who pass from fatal MIs typically have very bad disease, okay? 20% left main, most of the rest three-vessel disease, and most of the rest, two vessel involving the proximal LAD. And we know sometimes we're never going to find these. These are both women age 55 had fatal postoperative anterior MIs after hysterectomy. That was 25 years ago. Today I would call them Takatsubo cardiomyopathy, either spasm or a failure of the LED microvasculature to deal with the stress and the ST elevation MI in an artery that postmortem looked normal. And we know that a lot of patients have fairly normal looking arteries and they have infarcts because it's a diffuse vascular disease. And some patients mainly have that, particularly women, twice as likely as men to come in with an acute coronary syndrome and normal or nor nearly normal coronary arteries. That happens a lot. 12% of our patients at the University of Michigan with ACS who are women have normal or near normal coronary arteries. And so we're not going to find, we will, probably won't find this with stress testing. Um, you know, this one reminds me of a, I was paged one Friday afternoon by a, a fellow in cardiology at Stanford. Paged me, he said, you know, I just wanted you to know that the algorithm that you put into the guidelines doesn't work. And I said, thanks for the call. <laughs> Great talking to somebody from California. I said, tell me about the patient. Well, he was a 45-year-old guy. He did a, we did a triple A on him, and he had a fatal postoperative MI. I said, what did the post show? He said, we had, we had about 20% left main, and he ruptured that, that plaque, and he died. Your algorithm doesn't work. I said, well, you're right. It, it can't find mild lesions that cause, that end up with a plaque rupture. And there is no test I know of yet that can do that. And we're going to have to accept the fact that we're never going to be perfect. And certainly stress testing for severe fixed disease is not necessarily the answer, especially when a lot of infarcts are caused by mild disease with plaque rupture. Let's talk about medical therapy. And this is going to be a very disjointed presentation, okay? I want to prepare you for it. The first study of beta blockers by Mangano and colleagues suggested that a tenolol compared to placebo in patients having vascular surgery lowered perioperative ischemia, and by six months, there was a divergence of risk of MI or death. This would make sense. We know that beta blockers reduce angina. They reduce infarct after infarct, and so it wouldn't be a surprise. Um, and then came the decreased trial, elective aortic surgery. They had clinical markers of risk. You know those already. Then they had to have ischemia on a stress test. And then they got randomized to beta blocker or placebo. Important, titrated over days to weeks. Shooting for a heart rate of 60, but not at the expense of a low blood pressure. And if you saw the data from the decreased trial, standard care, 35% risk, Beta blocker, about 3.5% risk. Whoa. Let me ask you something. Have you ever seen any drug in medicine 
lower risk by 85%? I've never seen that. And I remember eight years ago presenting this table and saying, you know, sometimes I think this data is too good to believe. And Polderman's further showed that even if you had markers, if you had limited ischemia, beta blockers were very protective. And he then produced this paper that showed if you go to the OR with a heart rate under 65, the patients do a lot better. Well, you know, it's, it's very inconvenient to titrate beta blockers over days or weeks, right? It's very inconvenient. So maybe you ought to just blast them. Really get their heart rate down and do it quick. Osler said, I always like to use a new drug before its effectiveness wears off. I mean, he is smart. Osler is so sharp. Um, and Professor Poldermans resigns from the practice guideline committee because he became under investigation. Now, Lindenauer published this data looking at the Medicare population, suggesting that being on beta blockers at the time of non-cardiac surgery, if you had coronary disease, did lower your risk, but it was about a 10%, maybe maximum 20%. And he also showed that if you only had one of these markers, like diabetes, cerebrovascular disease, actually, there was no benefit if you only had one of them. And in fact, if you treated 200 diabetics, you'd harm one of them, beginning to give us another glimpse of the Bayesian thought that I need multiple markers of risk before I might justify beta blockers. And of course, this study from just this year, uh, looking again, I think this is a VA population, suggesting that if you have multiple markers, two or three or four, beta blockers favor risk reduction. But if you just have one, or zero, actually, you might not just help and you could harm. And one of the first duties of the physician is to educate the masses not to take medicines. So Osler is telling us something about beta blockers. And the diabetic story, here's 921 diabetics without CAD get randomized. No difference. Absolutely no difference. Diabetes is not an indication for perioperative beta blocker. It's been studied. It's not a coronary equivalent for this purpose. Don't do it. And then we get POIS. So the POIS investigators read Polderman's paper, and they say, you know what? We're going to prove once and for all that beta blockers lower risk. And we're going to randomize almost 8,500 patients. And by God, we are going to beta block them. We're going to give them 100 milligrams of topril. How many of you start your 83-year-old patients with hypertension on 100 milligrams of Toprol? Holy cow. They read the Polderman's paper on heart rate. And they said, you know, we're going to blast them. Now, it's really interesting. The major endpoint, the primary endpoint, showed a statistical benefit for beta blockers. I'm really happy with one of their secondary endpoints. That was death. And that was not good. Beta blockers killed people. Roughly 50. That's amazing. If you smash a beta blocker version with 100 milligrams of toprol, if you follow the next morning with 50 more, you are putting them in very severe jeopardy if they get into trouble. You're poisoning their, their inotropic and chronotropic response to trouble. And guess what happens? They have strokes and shock. So beta blockers have a severe dark side. And we were kind of rolling along thinking this was great news. It's not all great news. Now, don't stop beta blockers. You don't want to stop them because if you have high relative risk, these are revised risk indexes. And if you stop the beta blocker, this is hip surgery, there's a lot of events. And if you're anemic and you stop the beta blockers, there are a tremendous number of events. Keep the patients on the beta blockers. They'll get that catechol rebound. If you stop it, that's bad news. Keep them on it. So they should probably be given to patients who are already on them. And for patients who have high, clearly, ischemia, 
having major vascular surgery, but be careful. Start low, carefully titrate. Avoid low blood pressure. Um, this was on the cover of Lancet, kind of got our attention. This is from the POISE investigators. I use like metoprolol 25 BID and try to get to heart rates of 60, but not at the expense of a low blood pressure. And I'd prefer weeks rather than hours to titrate it. Here's the statin story, randomized trial of 100 vascular patients and a statin's lower risk. We know this, of course, if, you're, if you have vascular surgery, you should have been on a statin anyway. And these people got put on it and they had lower risk. And Lindenauer showed about a 35% risk reduction in Medicare patients who went to the OR for non-cardiac surgery. They had known coronary disease. Oh, that's exactly what the risk reduction is after an MI, it's 35%. Duh, of course, that makes sense. And then Poldermans does this study looking at placebo versus fluvastatin. Now look at that. That's a 50% risk reduction. That might be too good to believe. Or here's another study of both drugs, statin and beta blocker. Whoa, that's really great risk reduction. That's 75%. <laughs> We're on a roll here in Europe. And then, then it comes, and the institution reviews all the decreased trials. The New England Journal paper I talked about, it's too old because it's 10 years old. They didn't investigate it. But the study about stress testing, fictitious method of establishing outcome. Statins, no source data to investigate, only witnesses. Beta blockers and statins. Oh, the events did not match the hospital records. All of the trials. Many of them, the anchors of what we thought was true about beta blockers and statins are academic fraud. Not only that, the study of heart rate led to a trial that killed a number of patients because the dose was toxic. In all of my life, I've never encountered stuff in the research side of what we do that has affected me more deeply than this. And for the people in the audience who do research, a call for the truth and methods that are absolutely irreputable and constant vigilance. I mean, this is just un unbelievable. Statins should be given for patients who have atherosclerosis. That's all I can tell you. I don't know beyond that. Aspirin, we don't know. There's a study out last week in patients who've had a stent suggesting that the antiplatelet therapy, yes or no, no, no meaningful impact. Bleeding versus benefit, if they rupture a plaque, you you'd like them on aspirin. If they rupture a blood vessel, you'd like them not to be on aspirin. Um, what about revascularizing the heart? How are we doing for time, okay? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. So in the past, there were people like this person at all who were publishing data suggesting that prior coronary revascularization had a dramatic effect on perioperative risk, right? And what did this person, what, what was he thinking? Was he telling you that, oh yeah, by the way, you gotta survive the bypass to get the downstream benefit? Oops, slight problem with methodology. Yeah, and we of course thought that bad pipes needed to be bypassed or stretched. I thought that, I was wrong, totally wrong. We know that if you get bypass or angioplasty after unstable angina, the risk is low for a downstream non-cardiac surgery, a couple percent. That's good, but what about immediately fixing the heart? We know that stenting can be bad. This is his first study looking at um, stenting. And if you put a stent in the coronary artery and then do surgery within, 20, within two weeks, a lot of bad things happen. They bleed or they clot, or they do both. 
So we know that coronary stenting right before non-cardiac surgery is sort of a bad idea. Later, Berger and his colleagues show that after bare metal stenting, actually by six weeks, the risk is pretty low. And that fits what you know about bare metal stents. You should endothelialize that stent within about six weeks. And so the risk of the foreign body causing clotting should go down after four to eight weeks. And if we look at drug eluding stents, the data shows that early after a drug eluding stent, the risk of stent thrombosis is about 10%. But after three months, it's approaching 2%. And after six months, it's about 1.6 by a year. It's even lower. It's pretty flat thereafter. And again, in the last 10 days, a study of 148,000 patients who've had a coronary stent suggests that beyond six months, the risk of stent thrombosis is flat. And interestingly, there's no difference between drug eluding and bare metal stent in stent thrombosis. And the newer drug eluding stents um, have a better profile and they probably have a better drug delivery system. They probably endothelialize more completely. And this whole thing that we've been messing around with drug eluding stents is probably going to go away in the next guideline revision. What about going ahead and fixing the heart to lower their risk? Major vascular surgery. I'm a fisherman, so I love it when trialists come up with acronyms named after fish, even if it's CARP, Coronary Artery Vascularization Project. And they find vascular patients, they screen them, and they find patients with disease, and then they offer them either revascularization or medical therapy. That's a VA trial, so that, you know, 65 mostly men, lots of problems, angina, MI, heart failure, diabetes. Their LDLs are pretty low because a lot of them are on statins. That's important to know. Normally, EFs pretty much, but a lot of them have bad disease, three vessel. And they're having, you know, vascular surgery. If you look at the beta blocker use, 85% and a good number on statins. So stable patients having vascular surgery even with pretty advanced coronary disease, three vessel, on medical therapy, does fixing their heart lower their risk? And we learn from courage, it shouldn't. And we learn from CARP that it doesn't. There is no effect of revascularization at one month or two years or six years. Stable coronary disease should be managed medically around non-cardiac surgery. There is no benefit from revascularization. Now, of course, you're going to say, yeah, but what about, and I know, you're going to tell me about the left mains. And if you find a left main, it wants to be fixed. But it's a very small percentage. And how much are we willing to spend to try to find that occasional left main? I don't know, but I'm, I'm more and more um, interested in medical therapy. But I just leaned on that and something pops up. I'm not an interventionist at all. So uh, we probably should not do this. Uh, and, and in terms of if the patient has to go to surgery after a PCI right away, they got a bleeding colon cancer, just do balloon angioplasty. They can probably go in a matter of days. Currently, the guidelines say if they've had a bare metal stent, you ought to wait at least six weeks to have non-cardiac surgery. The guidelines currently say 12 months, and I'm telling you it'll be revised. It's going to be six months, but sooner if you have to. If the patient has a non-cardiac problem, the risk of stent thrombosis at 1.5%, that shouldn't make you wait months to take out a curable cancer. You accept the risk, and you move on. So routine revascularization, we shouldn't be doing it. So who needs a coronary angiogram? Well, the indications are the same as in your clinic, right? They have unstable or poor symptoms on medical therapy. Or rarely, stable patients with poor functional capacity facing a mammoth operation who've never been studied. Sometimes you find a patient like this and you want to screen them. So if they're just stable, I'm going to manage them medically. Coronary disease, heart failure, multiple markers. If I'm really worried, let's say they're having a thoracal abdominal operation. They've got diabetes, a prior MI, and angina. 
They've never been evaluated. I probably am going to do a stress echo to figure out if they get ischemic and what their ventricle is like. And unless their whole heart falls apart on a stress test, I'm going to manage them medically. But with the best medical therapy based on the information I can get. Clearly, if they're unstable, we've got to figure out what's going on with their heart. And if they just have the markers, manage the markers, right? Bad hyperlipidemia, statins. If they're hypertensive, judicious beta blockers may be helpful, but don't overdo it. Pain control matters. Pain probably drives catechols. Catechols probably drive events. So good, good pain control is probably a smart idea. And who should you surveil? Well, if they don't have any evidence of CAD, I would, you know, I'd just be watching for signs of post-op dysfunction. If they have known disease, when they go to the operating room, get an EKG at baseline and for two days, only look for trouble if it comes looking for you. Right? If they have VT, unexplained hypertension, unexplained hypotension. But if they're sailing along, if you start tr chasing troponins, you'll be very unhappy. You'll be so unhappy because stress causes troponin release, right? If you run a marathon and check your troponins at the finish line, there's a pretty good chance it's going to be up. Does that mean you need to be risk stratified for myocardial infarction? Of course not. Young, healthy patients bleed to a hemoglobin of six. A lot of them release troponin. Does that mean we have to stratify their coronaries? Of course not. It's such a sensitive test for myocardial stress. And yet sometimes we act like troponin means plaque rupture. It's wrong. And Reverend Bayes rolls in his grave every day when we chase troponins around your hospital. Now we're getting better. There, there are other biomarkers on the horizon. CRP may be useful. BNP, there's a paper this week, I think, in the annals on BNP. But how to factor all these in, we're not sure. We're just not sure. Now, if they do have a non-fatal event after non-cardiac surgery, screen them. They had a heart attack. You want to screen them just like you would a patient coming to the ER. They have a much higher risk of events in the next two years. So we want to screen them. So the foundation of coronary management in non-cardiac surgery is really identical to what you should be doing in your practice. It is true that sometimes your pre-op clinic visit is the first chance for Mrs. Smith to say, you know, when I go to the mailbox, I get crushing chest pain. Should I be worried? And you say, yeah, you should be worried. That's something I care about. And you pick that up with a good history and physical. Now, the guidelines work. When I went to Michigan in 1994, um, Michigan uh, had a factory around AAA assessment. There's 102 AAAs. We stressed them all, calfed a bunch of them, and revascularized a ton of them. And since I was the chair of the guideline committee and I was the chief, I said, you know what? We should probably not do this. This is too much. So we cut everything. This dropped in half. This dropped in more than half. And this dropped by 90%. Costs went way down. And the next year, continuing, we still were judicious in testing and treating. And it's very interesting what we found. There was a trend for a lowering of risk by doing less. Now, why could that be? Here's a model to study acute coronary plaque rupture. Take a patient with stable coronary disease, blow up a balloon in a coronary segment, put in a foreign body, and then the next day bleed them and give them pain and a lot of fluids. And make them a little prothrombotic while you're at it. It's a laboratory of coronary plaque rupture. That's what we do when we stent a patient who's stable and then take him to the operating room. We were causing non-fatal events, thinking we were doing good, and we weren't. Amazing. Prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. This guy got a Nobel Prize. <laughs> You know, I love it. Vice President Dan Quayle, he said, I have opinions, strong ones, that I don't always agree with. <laughs> the future will be better tomorrow. He also said that. I, I've always felt this to be true.
Uh, here's here's one here. Here's your president. He's got a trip on Air Force One, a million bucks, a new suit, sweet, six thousand, weatherproof jacket with a patch, that's five hundred bucks, uh, bulletproof. But your former commander in chief looking his troops with the lens caps on. <laughs> that I'm just not seeing what I want to see. So the point is, you know, in perioperative medicine, sometimes you find yourself wandering down this place and you step back and say, what am I thinking? It's a little breast lumpectomy. It's a funny looking Q wave on an EKG. And we're talking about a nuclear stress test in a calf. Where am I? How did I get here with my lens caps on? <laughs> Don't do it. This is a place for good horse sense. Medicine is an art of uncertainty, a science of probability. Perioperative medicine is all about Reverend Bayes. Use his theorem daily, and you'll be a very successful clinician. Let me um, thank you again for your hospitality. I hope a little levity is okay with you, and uh, it's my pleasure to do medical grand rounds. Thank you. I would be happy to try to answer questions. Yes, Nelson. And obviously, there are major economic implications of doing less for the, for the better good. <laughs> sure. Well, I think I think it's important for your perioperative uh, medical leaders to be in constant engagement with anesthesiology and your surgical colleagues to try to bring them along into this new reality. And, you know, it's the easiest thing for them to do is order a stress test and then send it to you, say, clear. And um, so we, we, have to, we have to educate all of ourselves around these messages. And I think the perioperative medical clinic is the best place to do that. It's the best place to do that. Yes, sir. Uh, of course, I enjoyed that. It was a very wonderful talk. There are two groups or one kind of uh, cohort that uh, we often face with a challenge and uh, you didn't touch on, which is the pre-transplant population, liver transplant, and the diabetic uh, undergoing kidney or kidney pancreas transplant. Sure. In, in a minute or so, do you have a comment on uh, how to address those? <laughs> well, you, so the first thing I would suggest is that you read the consensus document that I chaired that was published in circulation about 18 months ago. However, when you read that document, you will realize that in the absence of science, 12 people in a smoke-filled room with a good bottle of Pinot Noir <laughs> came up with a group of very soft recommendations. Now, the renal transplant group I would suggest probably stress echo as the most reasonable way to make sure there's not a disaster waiting to happen there. Some centers require coronary angiography. I think that's wrong for a lot of the reasons. Some patients places do nuclear. I think that's probably overkill in terms of both radiation and cost. Um, you know, the same clinical markers that work in this talk work in the renal and the liver talk, uh, transplant talks, and a lot of the renal patients have bad diabetes, and not a small number of them have coronary disease. And there we're also dealing with the other side, which is the societal side, of course. You know, should we be giving a, a, a young renal transplant to an old person with a really bad heart? Our job with the patient in front of us is to be Hippocratic and deal with that patient. But if you step back from this and say, whoa, what should we be doing? At our place, we tend to do dobutamine stress echo on patients before renal transplants, looking for disastrous ischemia and or LV dysfunction. The liver patients, we tend to look at with ultrasound, looking for left ventricular function and pulmonary hypertension. But again, the data guiding those recommendations is weak. And it's a, it's a place somebody here in this room needs to do research on. Okay? Thank you.